Chapter Twenty Three of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Goethe. In the bosom of the woods, which stretched for many miles from the immediate environs of Sicca, and placed on a gravel slope reaching down to a brook, which ran in a bottom close by, was a small rude hut of a kind peculiar to Africa and commonly ascribed to the wandering tribes who neither cared nor had leisure for a more stable habitation some might have called it a tent from the goat's hair cloth with which it was covered but it looked as to shape like nothing else than an inverted boat or the roof of a house set upon the ground inside it was seen to be constructed of the branches of trees twisted together or wattled the interstices or rather the whole surface being covered with clay being thus stoutly built lined and covered it was proof against the tremendous rains to which the climate for which it was made was subject along the centre ridge or backbone which varied in height from six to ten feet from the ground it was supported by three posts or pillars at one end it rose conically to an open aperture which served for chimney for skylight and for ventilator hooks were suspended from the roof for baskets articles of clothing weapons and implements of various kinds and a second cone excavated in the ground with the vertex downward served as a storehouse for grain the door was so low that an ordinary person must bend double to pass through it however it was in the winter months only when the rains were profuse that the owner of this respectable mansion condescended to creep into it in summer she had a drawing-room as it may be called of nature's own creation in which she lived and in one quarter of which she had her lair close above the hut was a high plot of level turf surrounded by old oaks and fringed beneath with thick underwood in the centre of this green rose a yew tree of primeval character indeed the whole forest spoke of the very beginnings of the world as if it had been the immediate creation of that voice which bade the earth clothe itself with green life but the place no longer spoke exclusively of its maker upon the trees hung the emblems and objects of idolatry and the turf was traced with magical characters littered about were human bones horns of wild animals wax figures spermaceti taken from vaults large nails to which portions of flesh adhered as if they had had to do with malefactors metal plates engraved with strange characters bottled blood hair of young persons and old rags the reader must not suppose any incantation is about to follow or that the place we are describing will have a prominent place in what remains of our tale but even if it be the scene of only one conversation and one event there is no harm in describing it as it appeared on that occasion the old crone who was seated in this bower of delight had an expression of countenance in keeping not with the place but with the furniture with which it was adorned that furniture told her trade whether the root of superstition might be traced deeper still and the woman and her traps were really and directly connected with the powers beneath the earth it is impossible to determine it is certain she had the will it is certain that that will was from their inspiration nay it is certain that she thought she really possessed the communications which she desired it is certain too she so far deceived herself as to fancy that what she learned by mere natural means came to her from a diabolical source she kept up an active correspondence with sicca she was consulted by numbers she was up with the public news the social gossip and the private and secret transactions of the hour and had before now even interfered in matters of state and had been courted by rival political parties but in the high cares and occupations of this interesting person we are not here concerned but with a conversation which took place between her and juba about the same hour of the evening as that of cacilius's escape but on the day after it while the sun was gleaming almost horizontally through the tall trunks of the trees of the forest well my precious boy said the old woman the choicest gifts of great charm be your portion you had excellent sport yesterday i warrant the rats squeaked hey and you beat the life out of them 
that scoundrel sacristan i suppose has taken up his quarters below you may say it answered juba the reptile he turned right about and would have made himself an honest fellow when it couldn't be helped good good returned goethe as if she had got something very pleasant in her mouth ah that is good but he did not escape on that score i do trust they pulled him to pieces all the more cheerfully said juba pulled him to pieces limb by limb joint by joint eh answered goethe did they skin him did they do anything to his eyes or his tongue anyhow it was too quickly juba slowly leisurely gradually yes it's like a glutton to be quick about it taste him handle him play with him that's luxury but to bolt him la Kezo's slade made a good end said juba he stood up for his views and died like a man the gods smite him but he has gone up up and she laughed up to what they call bliss and glory such glory but he's out of our domain you know but he did not die easy the boys worried him a good deal answered juba but it's not quite in my line mother all this i think you drink a pint of blood morning and evening and thrive on it old woman it makes you merry but it's too much for my stomach <laughs> my boy cried goethe you'll improve in time though you make wry faces now that you're young well and have you brought me any news from the capital is any one getting a rise in the world or a downfall how blows the wind are there changes in the camp this decius i suspect will not last long they all seem desperately frightened said juba lest they should not smite your friends hard enough goethe root and branch is the word they'll have to make a few christians for the occasion in order to kill them and i almost think they're about it he added thoughtfully they have to show that they are not surpassed by the rabble tis a pity christians are so few isn't it mother yes yes she said but we must crush them grind them many or few and we shall we shall callista's to come i don't see they are worse than other people said juba not at all except that they are commonly sneaks if callista turns why should not i turn too mother to keep her company and keep your hand in no no my boy returned the witch you must serve my master you are having your fling just now but you will buckle to in good time you must one day take some work with my merry men come here child said the fond mother and let me kiss you keep your kisses for your monkeys and goats and cats answered juba they're not to my taste old dame master my master i won't have a master i'll be nobody's servant i'll never stand to be hired nor cringe to a bully nor quake before a rod please yourself goethe i am a free man you're my mother by courtesy only goethe looked at him savagely why you're not going to be pious and virtuous juba a choice saint you'll make you shall be drawn for a picture why shouldn't i if i choose said juba if i must take service willy-nilly i'd any day prefer the others to that of your friend i've not left the master to take the man blaspheme not the great gods she answered or they'll do you a mischief yet i say again insisted juba if i must lick the earth it shall not be where your friend has trod it shall be in my brother's fashion rather than in yours goethe agellius she shrieked out with such disgust that it is wonderful she uttered the name at all ah you have not told me about him boy 
well is he safe in the pit or in the stomach of a hyena he's alive said juba but he has not got it in him to be a christian yes he's safe with his uncle ah jucundus must ruin him debauch him and then we'll make away with him you must not be in a hurry said goethe it must be body and soul no one shall touch him craven as he is answered juba i despise him but let him alone don't come across me said goethe sullenly i'll have my way why you know i could smite you to the dust as well as him if i chose but you have not asked me about callista answered juba it is really a capital joke but she has got into prison for certain for being a christian fancy it they caught her in the streets and put her in the guard-house and have had her up for examination you see they want a christian for the nonce it would not do to have none such in prison so they will flourish with her till decius bolts from the scene the furies have her cried goethe she is a christian my boy i told you so long ago callista a christian answered juba <laughs> she and agellius are going to make a match of it of some sort or other they're thinking of other things than paradise she and the old priest more likely more likely said goethe he's in prison with her in the pit as i trust your master has cheated you for once old woman said juba goethe looked at him fiercely and seemed waiting for his explanation he began singing she wheedled and coaxed but he was no fool he'd be his own master he'd not be her tool not the little black moor should send him to school she foamed and she cursed twas the same thing to him she laid well her trap but he carried his whim the priest scuffled off safe in life and in limb goethe was almost suffocated with passion sibianus has not escaped boy she asked at length i got him off said juba undauntedly a shade as of erebus passed over the witch's face but she remained quite silent mother i am my own master he continued i must break your assumption of superiority i'm not a boy though you call me so i'll have my own way yes i saved cyprianus you're a bloodthirsty old hag yes i've seen your secret doings did not i catch you the other day practising on that little child you had nailed him up by hands and feet against the tree and were cutting him to pieces at your leisure as he quivered and shrieked the while you were examining or using his liver for some of your black purposes it's not in my line but you gloated over it and when he wailed you wailed in mimicry you were panting with pleasure goethe was still silent and had an expression on her face awful from the intensity of its malignity she had uttered a low piercing whistle yes continued juba you revelled in it you chattered to the poor babe when it screamed as a nurse to an infant you called it pretty names and squeaked out your satisfaction each time you stuck it you old hag i'm not of your breed though they call us of kin i don't fear you he said observing the expression of her countenance i don't fear the immortal devil and he continued his song she beckoned the moon and the moon came down the green earth shrivelled beneath her frown but a man's strong will can keep his own while he was talking and singing her call had been answered from the hut an animal of some wonderful species had crept out of it and proceeded to creep and crawl mowing and twisting as it went along the trees and shrubs which rounded the grass plot when it came up to the old woman it crouched at her feet and then rose up upon its hind legs and begged she took hold of the uncouth beast and began to fondle it in her arms muttering something in its ear at length when juba stopped for a moment in his song 
she suddenly flung it right at him with great force saying take that she then gave utterance to a low inward laugh and leaned herself back against the trunk of the tree upon which she was sitting with her knees drawn up almost to her chin the blow seemed to act on juba as a shock on his nervous system both from its violence and its strangeness he stood still for a moment and then without saying a word he turned away and walked slowly down the hill as if in a maze then he sat down in an instant he started again with a great cry and began running at the top of his speed he thought he heard a voice speaking in him and however fast he ran the voice or whatever it was kept up with him he rushed through the underwood trampling and crushing it under his feet and scaring the birds and small game which lodged there at last exhausted he stood still for breath when he heard it say loudly and deeply as if speaking with his own organs you cannot escape from yourself then a terror seized him he fell down and fainted away End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of Callista by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Mother's Blessing. When his senses returned, his first impression was of something in him, not himself. He felt it in his breathing, he tasted it in his mouth. The brook which ran by Goethe's encampment had by this time become a streamlet, though still shallow. He plunged into it a feeling came upon him as if he ought to drown himself had it been deeper he rolled about in it in spite of its flinty and rocky bed when he came out of it his tunic sticking to him he tore it off his shoulders and let it hang round his girdle in shreds as it might the shock of the water however acted as a sedative upon him and the coolness of the night refreshed him he walked on for a while in silence suddenly the power within him began uttering by means of his organs of speech the most fearful blasphemies words embodying conceptions which had they come into his mind he might indeed have borne with patience before this or uttered in bravado but which now filled him with inexpressible loathing and a terror to which he had hitherto been quite a stranger he had always in his heart believed in a god but now he believed with a reality and intensity utterly new to him he felt it as if he saw him he felt there was a world of good and evil beings he did not love the good or hate the evil but he shrank from the one and he was terrified at the other and he felt himself carried away against his will as the prey of some dreadful mysterious power which tyrannized over him the day had closed the moon had risen he plunged into the thickest wood and the trees seemed to him to make way for him still they seemed to moan and to creak as they moved out of their place soon he began to see that they were looking at him and exulting over his misery they of an inferior nature had had no gift which they could abuse and lose and they remained in that honour and perfection in which they were created birds of the night flew out of them reptiles slunk away yet soon he began to be surrounded wherever he went by a circle of owls bats ravens crows snakes wild cats and apes which were always looking at him but somehow made way retreating before him and yet forming again and in order as he marched along he had passed through the wing of the forest which he had entered and penetrated into the more mountainous country he ascended the heights he was a taller stronger man than he had been he went forward with a preternatural vigour and flourished his arms with the excitement of some venous or gaseous intoxication he heard the roar of the wild beasts echoed along the woody ravines which were cut into the solid mountain rock with a reckless feeling as if he could cope with them as he passed the dens of the lion leopard hyena jackal wild boar and wolf there he saw them sitting at the entrance or stopping suddenly as they prowled along and eyeing him but not daring to approach 
he strode along from rock to rock and over precipices with the certainty and ease of some giant in eastern fable suddenly a beast of prey came across him in a moment he had torn up by the roots the stump of a wild vine plant which was near him had thrown himself upon his foe before it could act on the aggressive had flung it upon its back forced the weapon into its mouth and was stamping on its chest he knocked the life out of the furious animal and crying take that tore its flesh and applying his mouth to the wound sucked a draught of its blood he has passed over the mountain and and has descended its side bristling shrubs swamps precipitous banks rushing torrents are no obstacle to his course he has reached the brow of a hill with a deep placid river at the foot of it just as the dawn begins to break it is a lovely prospect which every step he takes is becoming more definite and more various in the daylight masses of oleander of great beauty with their red blossoms fringed the river and tracked out its course into the distance the bank of the hill below him and on the right and left was a maze of fruit trees about which nature if it were not the hand of man had had no thought except that they should be all together there the wild olive the pomegranate the citron the date the mulberry the peach the apple and the walnut formed a sort of spontaneous orchard across the water groves of palm trees waved their long and graceful branches in the morning breeze the stately and solemn ilex marshalled into long avenues showed the way to substantial granges or luxurious villas the green turf or grass was spread out beneath and here and there flocks and herds were emerging out of the twilight and growing distinct upon the eye elsewhere the ground rose up into sudden eminences crowned with chestnut woods or with plantations of cedar and acacia or wildernesses of the cork tree the turpentine the caroba the wild poplar and the phoenician juniper while overhead ascended the clinging tendrils of the hop and an underwood of myrtle closed their stems and roots a profusion of wild flowers carpeted the ground far and near juba stood and gazed till the sun rose opposite to him envying repining hating like satan looking in upon paradise the wild mountains or the locust smitten track would have better suited the tumult of his mind it would have been a relief to him to have retreated from so fair a scene and to have retraced his steps but he was not his own master and was hurried on sorely against his determined strong resolve and will crying out and protesting and shuddering the youth was forced along into the fullness of beauty and blessing with which he was so little in tune with rage and terror he recognized that he had no part in his own movements but was a mere slave in spite of himself he must go forward and behold a peace and sweetness which witnessed against him he dashed down through the thick grass plunged into the water and without rest or respite began a second course of aimless toil and travail through the day the savage dogs of the villages howled and fled from him as he passed by beasts of burden on their way to market which he overtook or met stood still foamed and trembled the bright birds the blue jay and golden oriole hid themselves under leaves and grass the storks a religious and domestic bird stopped their sharp clattering note from the high tree or farmhouse turret where they had placed their nests the very reptiles skulked away from his shadow as if it were poisonous the boors who were at their labour in the fields suspended it to look at one whom the furies were lashing and whirling on hour passed after hour the sun attained its zenith and then declined but this dreadful compulsory race continued oh what would he have given for one five minutes of oblivion of slumber of relief from the burning thirst which now consumed him but the master within him ruled his muscles and his joints and the intense pain of weariness had no concomitant prostration of strength suddenly he began to laugh hideously and he went forward dancing and singing loud and playing antics 
he entered a hovel made faces at the children till one of them fell into convulsions and he ran away with another and when some country people pursued him he flung the child in their faces saying take that and said he was pentheus king of thebes of whom he had never heard about to solemnize the orgies of bacchus and he began to spout a chorus of greek a language he had never learned or heard spoken now it is evening again and he has come up to a village grove where the rustics were holding a feast in honour of pan the hideous brutal god with yawning mouth horn and head and goat's feet was placed in a rude shed and a slaughtered lamb decked with flowers lay at his feet the peasants were frisking before him boys and women when they were startled by the sight of a gaunt wild mysterious figure which began to dance too he flung and capered about with such vigour that they ceased their sport to look on half with awe and half as a diversion suddenly he began to groan and to shriek as if contending with himself and willing and not willing some new act and the struggle ended in his falling on his hands and knees and crawling like a quadruped towards the idol when he got near his attitude was still more servile still groaning and shuddering he laid himself flat on the ground and wriggled to the idol as a worm and lapped up with his tongue the mingled blood and dust which lay about the sacrifice and then again as if nature had successfully asserted her own dignity he jumped up high in the air and falling on the god broke him to pieces and scampered away out of pursuit before the lookers-on recovered from their surprise another restless fearful night amid the open country but it seemed as if the worst had passed and though still under the heavy chastisement of his pride there was now more in juba of human action and of effectual will the day broke and he found himself on the road to sicca the beautiful outline of the city was right before him he passed his brother's cottage and garden it was a wreck the trees torn up the fences broken down and the room pillaged of the little that could be found there he went on to the city crying out agellius the gate was open and he entered he went on to the forum he crossed to the house of jucundus few people as yet were stirring in the place he looked up at the wall suddenly by the help of projections and other irregularities of the brickwork he mounted up upon the flat roof and dropped down along the tiles through the impluvium into the middle of the house he went softly into agellius's closet where he was asleep he roused him with the name of callista threw his tunic upon him which was by his side put his boots into his hands and silently beckoned him to follow him when he hesitated he still whispered to him callista and at length seized him and led him on he unbarred the street door and with a movement of his arm more like a blow than a farewell thrust him into the street then he barred again the door upon him and lay down himself upon the bed which agellius had left his good angel we may suppose had gained a point in his favour for he lay quiet and fell into a heavy sleep End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain callista in durance we will hope that the reader as well as agellius is attracted by the word callista and wishes to know something about her fate nay perhaps finds fault with us as having suffered him so long to content himself with the chance and second-hand information which jucundus or juba has supplied if we have been wanting in due consideration for him we now trust to make up for it when callista then had so boldly left the cottage to stop the intruders she had in one important point reckoned without her host she spoke latin fluently herself and could converse with the townspeople most of whom could do the same but it was otherwise with the inhabitants of the country numbers of whom as we have said were in sicca on the day of the outbreak the two fellows whom she went out to withstand 
knew neither her nor the latin tongue they were of a race which called itself canaanite and really was so huge gigantic men who looked like the sons of enoch described in holy writ they knew nothing of roads or fences and had scrambled up the hill as they could the shortest way and being free from the crowd with far more expedition than had they followed the beaten track she and they could not understand each other's speech but her appearance spoke for her and in consequence they seized on her as their share of the booty and without more ado carried her off towards sicca as they came up by a route of their own so they returned and entered the city by a gate more to the south not the septimian a happy circumstance as otherwise she would have stood every chance of being destroyed in that wholesale massacre which the soldiery inflicted on the crowd as it returned these giants then got possession of callista and she entered sicca upon the shoulder of one of them who danced in with no greater inconvenience than if he was carrying on it a basket of flowers or a box of millinery here the party met with the city police who were stationed at the gate down with your live luggage you rascals they said in their harsh punic what have you to do with plunder of this kind how came you by her she's one of those christian rats you worship answered the fellow who strong as he was did not relish a contest with some dozen of armed men long live the emperor we'll teach her to eat asses heads another time and brew fevers i found her with a party of christians she's nothing but a witch and she knows the consequences let her go you drunken animal said the constable still keeping his distance i'll never believe any woman is a christian let alone so young a one and now i look at her as far as i can see by this light i think she's priestess of one of the great temples up there she can turn herself into anything said the other of her capturers young or old i saw her one night near madora a month ago in the tubes in the shape of a black cat away with you both in the name of the suffets of sicca and all the magistracy cried the official give up your prisoner to the authorities of the place and let the law take its course but the canaanites did not seem disposed to give her up and neither party liking to attack the other a compromise took place well said the guardian of the night the law must be vindicated and the peace preserved my friends you must submit to the magistrates but since she happens to be on your shoulder my man let her even remain there and we depute you as a beast of burden to carry her for us thereby to save us the trouble here child he continued you're our prisoner so you shall plead your own cause in the popina there long live decius pious and fortunate long live this ancient city colony and municipium cheer up my lass and sing us a stave or two as we go for i'll pledge a cyanthus of unmixed that if you choose you can warble notes as sweet as the man gum callista was silent but she was perfectly collected and ready to avail herself of any opportunity to better her condition they went on towards the forum where a police office as we now speak was situated but did not reach it without an adventure the roman military force at sicca was not more than a century of men the greater number were at this moment at the great gate waiting for the mob a few in parties of three and four were patrolling the city several of these were at the entrance of the forum when the party came up to it and it happened that a superior officer who was an assistant to what may be called the military resident of the place a young man on whom much of the duty of the day had devolved was with the soldiers she had known him as a friend of her brother's and recognized him in the gloom and at once took advantage of the meeting help she said gentlemen help calphurnius these rascals are carrying me off to some den of their own the tribune at once knew her voice what he cried with great astonishment what my pretty greek you most base infamous and unmannerly scoundrels down with her this instant what have you to do with that young lady you villains unless you would have me crack your african skulls with the hilt of my sword down with her i say there was no resisting a roman voice but prompt obedience is a rarity and the ruffians began to parley my noble master 
said the constable she's our prisoner jove preserve you and bacchus and ceres bless you my lord tribune and long life to the emperor decius in these bad times but she is a rioter my lord one of the ring leaders and a christian and a witch to boot cease your vile gutturals you animal cried the officer or i will ram them down your throat with my pike to digest them put down the lady beast are you thinking twice about it go lucius he said to a private kick him away and bring the woman here callista was surrendered but the fellow sullen at the usage he had met with and spiteful against calphurnius as the cause of it cried out maliciously mind what you are at noble sir it is not our affair you can fry your own garlic but an emperor is an emperor and an edict is an edict and a christian is a christian and i don't know what high places will say to it but it's your affair take notice he continued as he got to a safer distance raising his voice still higher that the soldiers might hear yon girl is a christian priestess caught in a christian assembly sacrificing asses and eating children for the overthrow of the emperor and the ruin of his loyal city of sicca and i have been interrupted in the discharge of my duty by a constable of the place see whether calphurnius will not bring again upon us the plague the murrain the locusts and all manner of larvae and maniae before the end of the story this speech perplexed calphurnius as it was intended it was impossible he could dispose of callista as he wished with such a charge formally uttered in the presence of his men he knew how serious the question of christianity was at that moment and how determined the imperial government was on the eradication of its professors he was a good soldier devoted to headquarters and had no wish to compromise himself with his superiors or to give bystanders an advantage over him by setting a prisoner at liberty without inquiry who had been taken in a christian's house he muttered an oath and said to the soldiers well my lads to the triumviri with her since it must be so cheer up my star of the morning bright beam of hellas it is only as a matter of form and you will be set at liberty as soon as they look on you and with these words he led the way to the Ophicium. but the presiding genius of the Ophicium was less accommodating than he had anticipated it might be that he was jealous of the soldiery or of their particular interference or indignant at the butchery at the great gate of which the news had just come or out of humour with the day's work and especially with the christians at any rate calphurnius found he had better have taken a bolder step and have carried her as a prisoner to the camp however nothing was now left for him but to depart and callista fell again into the hands of the city though of the superior functionaries who procured her a lodging for the night and settled to bring her up for examination next morning the morning came and she was had up what passed did not transpire but the issue was that she was remanded for a further hearing and was told she might send to her brother and acquaint him where she was he was allowed one interview with her and he came away almost out of his senses saying she was bewitched and fancied herself a christian what precisely she had said to him which gave this impression he could hardly say but it was plain there must be something wrong or there would not be that public process and formal examination which was fixed for the third day afterwards End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain what can it all mean were the origin of juba's madness or whatever the world would call it of a character which admitted of light writing about it much might be said on the surprise of the clear-headed narrow-minded positive and easy-going jucundus when he found one nephew substituted for another and had to give over his wonder at agellius in order to commence a series of acts of amazement and consternation at juba he summoned jupiter and juno bacchus ceres pomona neptune mercury minerva and great rome to witness the marvellous occurrence and then he had recourse to the infernal gods pluto and Proserpine, down to cerberus if he be one of them but after all there the portent was in spite of all the deities which olympus or arcadia or latium ever bred and at length it had a nervous effect upon the old gentleman's system 
and for the first evening after it he put all his good things from him and went to bed supperless and songless what had been juba's motive in the exploit which so unpleasantly affected his uncle it is of course quite impossible to say whether his mention of callista's name was intended to be for the benefit of her soul or the ruin of agellius's must be left in the obscurity in which the above narrative presents it to us so far alone is certain though it does not seem to throw light on the question that on his leaving his uncle's house in the course of the forenoon which he did without being pressed to stay he was discovered prancing and gesticulating in the neighbourhood of callista's prison so as to excite the attention of the apparitor or constable who guarded the entrance and who alarmed at his wildness sent for some of his fellows and with their assistance repelled the intruder who thereupon scudding out at the eastern gate was soon lost in the passes of the mountain to one thing however we may pledge ourselves that juba had no intention of shaking even for one evening the nerves of jucundus yet shaken they were till about the same time twenty-four hours afterwards and when in that depressed state he saw nothing but misery on all sides of him juba was lost agellius worse of course he had joined himself to his sect he should never see him again and how should he ever hold up his head well he only hoped agellius would not be boiled in a cauldron or roasted at a slow fire if this were done he positively must leave sicca and the most thriving trade which any man had in the whole of the proconsulate and then that little callista ah what a real calamity was there anyhow he had lost her and what should he do for a finisher of his fine work in marble or metal she was a treasure in herself altogether the heavens were very dark and it was scarcely possible for any one who knew well his jovial cast of countenance to keep from laughing whatever his real sympathy at the unusual length and blankness which were suddenly imposed upon it while he sat thus at his shop window which as it were framed him for the contemplation of passers-by on the day of the escape of agellius and the day before callista's public examination aristo rushed in upon him in a state of far more passionate and more reasonable grief he had called indeed the day before but he found a pleasure in expending his distress upon others and he came again to get rid of its insupportable weight by discharging it in a torrent of tears and exclamations however at first the words of both moved slow as the poet says and went off in a sort of dropping fire well said jucundus in a depressed tone he's not come to you of course who agellius oh agellius no he's not with me then after a pause aristo added why should he be oh i don't know i thought he might be he's gone he's been gone since early morning indeed no i don't know where he is how came he with you i told you yesterday but you have forgotten i was sheltering him but he's gone for ever indeed and his brother's mad horribly mad and he slapped his hand against his thigh i always thought it answered aristo uh, did you uh, oh yes so it is but it's very different from what it ever was the furies have got hold of him with a vengeance he's frantic oh if you had seen him two boys both mad it's all the father i thought you'd like to hear something about dear sweet callista said her brother yes i should indeed answered jucundus by esculapius they're all mad together well it is like madness cried aristo with great vehemence the world's going mad answered jucundus who was picking up since he began to talk an exercise which was decidedly good for him we are all going mad i shall get crazed the townspeople are crazed already what an abominable brutal piece of business was that three days ago i put up my shutters did it come near you 
all on account of one or two beggarly christians and my poor boy what harm could two or three toads and vipers though they be do here they might have been trodden down easily it's another thing at carthage catch the ringleaders i say make examples the foxes escape and our poor ganders suffer aristo pierced with his own misery had no heart or head to enter into the semi-political ideas of jucundus who continued yes it's no good the empire's coming to pieces mark my words i told you so if those beasts were let alone they have been let alone remedies are too late decius will do no good no one's safe farewell my friends i am going like poor dear callista i shall be in prison and like her find myself dumb ah <sighs> yes callista how did you find her oh dear sweet suffering girl cried her brother yes indeed answered jucundus yes meditatively she is a dear sweet suffering girl i thought he might perhaps have taken her off that was my hope he was so set upon hearing where she was whether she could be got out it struck me he had made the best of his way to her she could do anything with him and she loved him she did i'm convinced of it nothing shall convince me otherwise bring them together i said and they will rush into each other's arms but they're bewitched the whole world's bewitched mark my words i have an idea who is at the bottom of this oh groaned out aristo i care not for top or bottom i care not for the whole world or for anything at all but callista if you could have seen the dear patient sufferer and the poor fellow burst into a flood of tears oh, but bear up bear up said jucundus who by this time was considerably better show yourself a man my dear aristo these things must be they are the lot of human nature you remember what the tragedian says uh stay no it's the comedian it's menander to orcus and erebus with all the tragedy and comedy that ever was spouted exclaimed aristo can you do nothing for me can't you give me a crumb of consolation or sympathy encouragement or suggestion i am a stranger in the country and so is this dear sister of mine whom i was so proud of and who has been so good and kind and gentle and sweet she loved me so much she never grudged me anything she let me do just what i would with her come here go there it was just as i would there we were two orphans together ten years since when i was double her age she wished to stay in greece but she came to this detestable africa all for me she would be gay and bright when i would have her so she had no will of her own and she set her heart upon nothing and was pleased anywhere she had not an enemy in the world i protest she is worth all the gods and goddesses that ever were hatched and here in this ill-omened africa the evil eye has looked at her and she thinks herself a christian when she is just as much a hippogriff or a chimera well but aristo said jucundus i was going to tell you who is at the bottom of it callista's mad agellius is mad juba is mad and strabo was mad but it was his wife old goethe that drove him mad and there i think is the beginning of our troubles oh come in come in cornelius he cried seeing his roman friend outside and relapsing for the moment into his lugubrious tone come in cornelius and give us some comfort if you can well this is like a friend i know if you can help me you will cornelius answered that he was going back to carthage in a day or two and came to embrace him and had hoped to have a parting supper before he went that's kind answered jucundus but first tell me all about this dreadful affair for you are in the secrets of the capital have they any clue what has become of my poor agellius cornelius had not heard of the young man's troubles and was full of consternation at the news what agellius really a christian 
he said, and at such a moment? Why, I thought you talked of some young lady who was to keep him in order. She is a Christian, too, replied Jucundus, and a silence ensued. It's a bad world, he continued. She's imprisoned by the triumviri. What will be the end of it? Cornelius shook his head and looked mysterious. You don't mean it, said Jucundus. Not anything so dreadful, I do trust, Cornelius. Not the stake? Cornelius still looked gloomy and pompous. Nothing in the way of torture? He went on. Not the rack or the pitchfork? It's a bad business. On your own showing, said Cornelius, it's a bad business. Can you do nothing for us, Cornelius? cried Aristo. The great people in Carthage are your friends. Oh, Cornelius, I'd do anything for you. I'd be your slave. She's no more a Christian than great Jove. She has nothing about her of the cut, not a shred of her garment, or a turn of her hair. She's a Greek from head to foot, within and without. She's as bright as the day. No, oh, we have no friends here. Dear Callista, you will be lost because you are a foreigner. And the passionate youth began to tear his hair. Oh, Cornelius, he continued, if you can do anything for us. Oh, she shall sing and dance to you. She shall come and kneel down to you and embrace your knees and kiss your feet, as I do, Cornelius. And he knelt down and would have taken hold of Cornelius's beard. Cornelius had never been addressed with so poetical a ceremonial, which nevertheless he received with awkwardness indeed, but with satisfaction. I hear from you, he said with pomposity, that your sister is in prison on suspicion of Christianity. The case is a simple one. Let her swear by the genius of the emperor, and she is free. Let her refuse it, and the law must take its course. And he made a slight bow well but she is under a delusion persisted aristo which cannot last long she says distinctly that she is not a christian is not that decisive but then she won't burn incense she won't swear by rome she tells me she does not believe in jupiter nor i can anything be more senseless it is the act of a madwoman i say my girl the question is are you to be brought to shame are you to die by the public sword die in torments oh i shall go mad as well as she he screamed out she was so clever so witty so sprightly so imaginative so versatile why there's nothing she couldn't do she could model paint play on the lyre sing act she could work with the needle she could embroider she made this girdle for me it's all that agellius it's agellius i beg your pardon jucundus but it is and he threw himself on the ground and rolled in the dust i have been telling our young friend said jucundus to cornelius to exert self-control and to recollect menander ne quid nimis grieving does no good but these young fellows it's no use at all speaking to them do you think you could do anything for us, Cornelius? Why, answered Cornelius, since I have been here, I have fallen in with a very sensible man, and a man of remarkably sound political opinions. He has a great reputation. He is called Polemo, and is one of the professors at the Mercury. He seems to me to go to the root of these subjects, and I'm surprised how well we agreed. He's a Greek, as well as this young gentleman's sister i should recommend him to go to polemo if any one could disabuse her mind it is he true true cried aristo starting up but no you can do it better you have power with government the proconsul will listen to you the magistrates are afraid of him they don't wish to touch the poor girl not they but there's such a noise everywhere and so much ill blood and so many spies and informers and so much mistrust but why should it come upon callista why should she be a sacrifice but you'd oblige the doomvirs as much as me in getting her out of the scrape but what good would it do if they took her dear life only get us the respite of a month the delusion would vanish in a month get two months if you can 
or as long as you can you know perhaps they would let us steal out of the country and no one the wiser and no harm to any one it was a bad job our coming here we know nothing at rome of feelings and intentions and motives and distinctions said cornelius and we know nothing of understandings connivances and evasions we go by facts rome goes by facts the question is what is the fact does she burn incense or does she not does she worship the ass or does she not however we'll see what can be done and so he went on informing the pair of mourners that as far as his influence extended he would do something in behalf both of agellius and callista end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain am i a christian the sun had now descended for the last time before the solemn day which was charged with the fate of callista and what was the state of mind of one who excited such keen interest in the narrow circle within which she was known and how does it differ from what it was some weeks before when agellius last saw her she would have been unable to say herself so is the kingdom of god as if a man should cast seed into the earth and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up whilst he knoweth not she might indeed have been able afterwards on looking back to say many things of herself and she would have recognized that while she was continually differing from herself in that she was changing yet it was not a change which involved contrariety but one which expanded itself in as it were concentric circles and only fulfilled as time went on the promise of its beginning every day as it came was so to say the child of the preceding the parent of that which followed and the end to which she tended could not get beyond the aim with which she set out yet had she been asked at the time of which we speak where was her principle and her consistency what was her logic or whether she acted on reason or on impulse or on feeling or in fancy or in passion she would have been reduced to silence what did she know about herself but that to her surprise the more she thought over what she heard of christianity the more she was drawn to it and the more it approved itself to her whole soul and the more it seemed to respond to all her needs and aspirations and the more intimate was her presentiment that it was true the longer it remained on her mind as an object the more it seemed unlike the mythology or the philosophy of her country or the political religion of rome to have an external reality and substance which deprived objections to it of their power and showed them to be at best but difficulties and perplexities but then again if she had been asked what was christianity she would have been puzzled to give an answer she would have been able to mention some particular truths which it taught but neither to give them their definite and distinct shape nor to describe the mode in which they were realized she would have said i believe what has been told me as from heaven by chione agellius and cecilius and it was clear she could say nothing else what the three told her in common and in concord was at once the measure of her creed and the ground of her acceptance of it it was that wonderful unity of sentiment and belief in persons so dissimilar from each other so distinct in their circumstances so independent in their testimony which recommended to her the doctrine which they were so unanimous in teaching she had long given up any belief in the religion of her country as to philosophy it dwelt only in conjecture and opinion whereas the very essence of religion was as she felt a recognition of the worshippers on the part of the object of it religion could not be without hope to worship a being who did not speak to us recognize us love us was not religion it might be a duty it might be a merit 
but her instinctive notion of religion was the soul's response to a god who had taken notice of the soul it was loving intercourse or it was a name now the three witnesses who had addressed her about christianity had each of them made it to consist in the intimate divine presence in the heart it was the friendship or mutual love of person with person here was the very teaching which already was so urgently demanded both by her reason and her heart which she found nowhere else which she found existing one and the same in a female slave in a country youth in a learned priest this was the broad impression which they made upon her mind when she turned to consider more in detail what it was they taught or what was implied in that idea of religion which so much approved itself to her she understood them to say that the creator of heaven and earth almighty all good clothed in all the attributes which philosophy gives him the infinite had loved the soul of man so much and her soul in particular that he had come upon earth in the form of a man and in that form had gone through sufferings in order to unite all souls to him that he desired to love and to be loved that he had said so that he had called on man to love him and did actually bring to pass this loving intercourse of him and man in those souls who surrendered themselves to him she did not go much further than this but as much as this was before her mind morning noon and night it pleaded in her it importuned her it would not be rebuffed it did not mind her moods or disgusts or doubts or denials or dismissals but came again and again it rose before her in spite of the contempt reproach and persecution which the profession of it involved it smiled upon her it made promises to her it opened eternal views to her and it grew upon her convictions in clearness of perception in congruity and in persuasiveness moreover the more she thought of chione of agellius and of cecilius the more surely did she discern that this teaching wrought in them a something which she had not they had about them a simplicity a truthfulness a decision an elevation a calmness and a sanctity to which she was a stranger which spoke to her heart and absolutely overcame her the image of cecilius in particular came out prominently and eloquently in her memory not in his words so much as in his manner in spite of what she had injuriously said to him she really felt drawn to worship him as if he were the shrine and the home of that presence to which he bore such solemn witness oh the change when as if in punishment for her wild words against him she found herself actually in the hands of lawless men who were as far below her in sentiment as he was above her oh the change when she was dizzied by their brutal vociferations and rapid motion and that breath and atmosphere of evil which steamed up from the rankness of their impiety oh the thankfulness which rose up in her heart though but vaguely directed to an object when she found the repose and quiet though it was that of a prison for young as she was she had become tired of all things that were seen and had no strong desire except for meditation on the great truths which she did not know one day passes and then another and now the morning and the hour is come when she must appear before the magistrates of sicca with dread with agitation she looks forward to the moment she has not yet a peace within her her peace is the stillness of the room in which she is imprisoned she knows it will pass away when she leaves it she knows that again she must be in the hands of cruel godless men with whom she has no sympathy but she has no stay whereon to lean in the terrible trial her brother comes to her he affects to forget her perverseness or delusion he comes to her with a smile and throws his arms around her and callista repels 
from some indescribable feeling his ardent caress as if she were no longer his he has come to accompany her to court by an indulgence which he had obtained to support her there to carry her through and to take her back in triumph home my sister why that strange piteous look upon thy countenance why that paleness of thy cheek why that whisper of thy lips why those wistful gentle pleadings of thine eyes sweet eyes and brow and cheek in which i have ever prided myself why so backward why so distant and unfriendly am i not come to rescue thee from a place where thou never shouldst have been where thou ne'er shalt be again callista what is this mystery speak such as this was the mute expostulation conveyed in aristo's look and in the fond grasp of his hand while treading down forcibly within him his memory and his fears of her great change he determined she should be to him still all that she had ever been but how altered was that look and how relaxed that grasp when at length her misery found words and she said to him in agitation my time is short i want some christian a christian priest it was as though she had never shown any tendency before to the proscribed religion the words came to him with the intensity of something new and unimagined hitherto he clasped his hands in emotion turned white and could but say callista if she had made confession of the most heinous of crimes if she had spoken of murder or some black treachery against himself of some enormity too great for words it might have been but his sister his pride and delight after all and certainly a christian better far had she said she was leaving him for ever to abandon herself to the degrading service of the temples better had she said she had taken hemlock or had an asp in her bosom than that she should choose to go out of the world with the tortures the ignominy the malediction of the religion of slaves time waits for no man nor does the court of justice nor the subcellia of the magistrate the examination is to be held in the basilica at the forum and it requires from us a few words of explanation beforehand the local magistrates then could only try the lesser offences and decide civil suits cases of suspected christianity were reserved for the roman authorities still preliminary examinations were not unfrequently conducted by the city duumvirs or even in what may be called the police courts and this may have especially been the case in the proconsulates propraetors and presidents were in the appointment of the emperor and joined in their persons the supreme civil and military authority such provinces perhaps were better administered but there would be more of arbitrariness in their rule and it would not be so acceptable to the ruled the proconsuls on the other hand were representatives of the senate and had not the military force directly in their hands the natural tendency of this arrangement was to create on the one hand a rivalry between the civil and military establishments and on the other to create a friendly feeling between the proconsul and the local magistracy thus not long before the date of this history we read of gordian the proconsul enjoying a remarkable popularity in his african province and when the people rose against the exactions of the imperial procurator as referred to in a former page they chose and supported gordian against him but however this might be in general so it was at this time at sicca that the proconsular officium and the city magistrates were on a good understanding with each other whereas there was some collision between the latter and the military not much depends in the conduct of our story upon this circumstance but it must be taken to account for the examination of callista in the forum and for some other details which may follow before we come to the end of it the populace was collected about the gates and within the ample space of the basilica but they gave expression to no strong feeling on the subject of a christian delinquent the famine the sickness and above all the lesson which they had received so lately from the soldiers had both diminished their numbers and cowed their spirit they were sullen too and resentful 
and with the changeableness proverbial in a multitude had rather have witnessed the beheading of a magistrate or the burning of a tribune than the torture and death of a dozen of wretched christians besides they had had a glut of christian blood a reaction of feeling had taken place and in spite of the suspicion of witchcraft the youth and the beauty of callista recommended her to their compassion the magistrates were seated on the subcellia one of the duumvirs presiding in his white robe bordered with purple his lictors with staves not fasces standing behind him in the vestibule of the court to confront the prisoner on her first entrance were the usual instruments of torture the charge was one which can only be compared in the estimation of both state and people in that day to that of witchcraft poisoning parricide or other monstrous iniquity in christian times there were the heavy boiea a yoke for the neck of iron or of wood the fetters the nervi or stocks in which hands and feet were inserted at distances from each other which strained or dislocated the joints there too were the virge or rods with thorns in them the flagra lori and plumblati whips and thongs cutting with iron or bruising with lead the heavy clubs the hook for digging into the flesh the ungula said to have been a pair of scissors the scorpio and pectin iron combs or rakes for tearing and there was the wheel fringed with spikes on which the culprit was stretched and there was the fire ready lighted with the water hissing and groaning in the large cauldrons which were placed upon it callista had lost forever that noble intellectual composure of which we have several times spoken she shuddered at what she saw and almost fainted and while waiting for her summons leaned heavily against the merciless cornicularius at her side at length the judge began let the servant from the officium stand forth the officialis answered that he had brought a prisoner charged with christianity she had been brought to him by the military on the night of the riot the scriba then read out the deposition of one of the stationarii to the effect that he and his fellow-soldiers had received her from the hands of the civic force on the night in question and had brought her to the office of the triumvirs bring forward the prisoner said the judge she was brought forward here she is answered the officialis according to the prescribed form what is your name said the judge she answered callista the judge then asked if she was a free woman or a slave she answered free the daughter of orsilochus lapidary of proconensis some conversation then went on among the magistrates as to her advocate or defensor aristo presented himself but the question arose whether he was togatus he was known however to several magistrates and was admitted to stand by his sister then the scriba read the charge viz that callista was a christian and refused to sacrifice to the gods it was a plain question of fact which required neither witnesses nor speeches at a sign from the duumvir in came two priests bringing in between them the small altar of jupiter the charcoal was ready lighted the incense at the side and the judge called to the prisoner to sprinkle it upon the flame for the good fortune of decius and his son all eyes were turned upon her i am not a christian she said i told you so before i have never been to a christian place of worship nor taken any christian oath nor joined in any christian sacrifice and i should lie did i say that i was in any sense a christian there was a silence then the judge said prove your words there is the altar the flame and the incense sacrifice to the genius of the emperor she said what can i do i am not a christian the judges looked at each other as much as to say it is the old story it is that inexplicable hateful obstinacy which will neither yield to reason common sense expediency or fear the duumvir only repeated the single word sacrifice she stopped a while 
then she came forward with a hurried step oh my feet she cried why was i born why am i in this strait i have no god what can i do i am abandoned why should i not do it she stopped then she went right on to the altar she took the incense suddenly she looked up to heaven and started and threw it away i cannot i dare not she cried out there was a great sensation in court evidently insane said some of the more merciful of the decurions poor thing poor thing her brother ran up to her talked to her conjured her fell down on his knees to her took her hand violently and would have forced her to offer in vain all he could get from her was i am not a christian indeed i am not a christian i have nothing to do with them oh the misery she is mad cried aristo my lord judges listen to me she was seized by brutal ruffians during the riot and the fright and shock have overcome her give her time oh give her time and she will get right she's a good religious girl she has done more work for the temples than any girl in sica half the statues in the city are her finishing many of you my lords have her handiwork she works with me do not add to my anguish in seeing her deranged by punishing her as a criminal a christian do not take her from me sentence her and you end the whole matter give her a chance and she will certainly be restored to the gods and to me will you put her to death because she is mad what was to be done the court was obsequious to the proconsul afraid of rome jealous that the mob should have been more forward than the magistracy had the city moved sooner as soon as the edict came there would have been no rising no riot already they had been called on for a report about that riot and an explanation if ever they had need to look sharp what they were doing it was now on the other hand callista and her brothers had friends among the judges as we have said and their plea was at once obvious and reasonable if she persists she persists and nothing can be said we don't wish to be disloyal or careless of the emperor's commands if she is obstinate she must die but she dies quite as usefully to us with quite as much effect a month hence as now not that we ask you to define a time on your own authority simply do this write to carthage for advice the government can answer within an hour if it chooses merely say here is a young woman who has ever been religious and well conducted of great accomplishments and known especially for her taste and skill in religious art who since the day of the riot has suddenly refused to take the test she can give no reason for her refusal and protests she is not a christian her friends say that the fright has turned her brain but if kindly treated and kept quiet she will come round and do all that is required of her what are we to do at last callista's friends prevailed it was decided that the judges should pass over this examination altogether as if it had been rendered informal by callista's conduct had they recognized it as a proper legal process they must have sentenced and executed her such a decision was of this further advantage to her that nothing was altered as to her place of confinement instead of being handed over to the state prison she remained in her former lodging though in custody and was allowed to see her friends there had been very little chance of her recovery supposing she was mad or of ever coming out if she had once gone into the formidable carcare meanwhile the magistrates sent to carthage for instructions End of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of callista by john henry newman this librivox recording is in the public domain a sick call aristo was not a fellow to have very long distresses he never would have died of love or of envy 
for honour or for loss of property but his present calamity was one of the greatest he could ever have and weighed upon him as long as ever any one could his love for his sister was real but it would not do to look too closely into the grounds of it if we are obliged to do so we must confess to a suspicion that it lay rather in certain outward nay accidental attributes of callista than in callista herself did she lose her good looks or her amiable unresisting submission to his wishes whatever they were she would also lose her hold upon his affections this is not to make any severe charge against him considering how it is with the common run of brothers and sisters husbands and wives at the same time most people certainly are haunted by the memory of the past and love for auld lang syne and this aristo might indeed have had and perhaps had not he loved chiefly for the present and by the hour however at the present time he was in a state of acute suffering and under its paroxysm he bethought him again of cornelius's advice which he had rejected to betake himself to polemo he had a distant acquaintance with him sufficient for his purpose and he called on him at the mercury after the latter's lecture palema was no fool though steeped in affectation and self-conceit and aristo fancied that his sister might be more moved by a philosophical compatriot than any one else palema's astonishment however when the matter was proposed to him surpassed words and it showed how utterly aristo was absorbed in his own misery that the possibility of such a reception should not have occurred to him what he the friend of plotinus of rogatian and the other noble men and women who were his fellow disciples at rome he a member of the intellectual aristocracy of the metropolis of the world what he to visit a felon in prison and when he found the felon was a christian he fully thought that aristo had come to insult him and was on the point of bidding him leave him to himself aristo however persisted and his evident anguish and some particulars which came out softened him callista was a greek literate or blue stocking she had never indeed worn the philosophic pallium as some christian martyrs afterwards if not before have done st catherine and st euphemia but there was no reason why she should not do so polemo recollected having heard of her at the capital and in the triclinium of one of the decurions as a lady of singular genius and attainments and he lately had made an attempt to form a female class of hearers and it would be a feather in his cap to make a convert of her so not many days after one evening accompanied by aristo he set out in his litter to the lodging where she was in custody not however without much misgiving when it came to the point some shame and a consequent visible awkwardness and stiffness in his manner all the perfumes he had about him could not hinder the disgust of such a visit rising up into his nostrils callista's room was very well for a prison it was on the ground floor of a house of many stories close to the officium of the triumvirate though not any longer under their strict jurisdiction she was allowed to remain where she had first been lodged she was in one of the rooms belonging to an apparitor of that officium and as he had a wife or at least a partner to take care of her she might consider herself very well off however the reader must recollect that we are in africa and in the month of july and our young greek was little used to heats which made the whole city nothing less than one vast oven through the greater part of the twenty-four hours in lofty spacious apartments the resource adopted is to exclude the external air and to live as greenlanders with closed windows and doors this was both impossible and would have been unsuccessful if attempted in the small apartment of callista but fever of mind is even worse than the heat of the sky and it is undeniable that her health and her strength and her appearance are affected by both the physical and the moral enemy the beauty which was her brother's delight is waning away and the shadows 
if not the rudiments of a diviner loveliness which is of expression not of feature which inspires not human passion but diffuses chaste thoughts and aspirations are taking its place aristo sees the change with no kind of satisfaction the room has a bench two or three stools and a bed of rushes in one corner a staple is firmly fixed in the wall and an iron chain light however and long if the two ideas can be reconciled reaches to her slender arm and is joined to it by an iron ring on polemo's entering the room his first exclamation was to complain of its closeness but he had to do a work so he began it without delay callista on her part started she had no wish for his presence she was reclining on her couch and she sat up she was not equal to a controversy nor did she mean to have one whatever might be the case with him callista my life and joy dear callista said her brother i have brought the greatest man in sicca to see you callista cast upon him an earnest look which soon subsided into indifference he had a rose of cyrene in his hand whose perfume he diffused about the small room it is polemo continued aristo the friend of the great plotinus who knows all philosophies and all philosophers he has come out of kindness to you callista acknowledged his presence it was certainly she said a great kindness for any one to visit her and there polemo replied by a compliment he said it was socrates visiting aspasia there had always been women above the standard of their sex and they had ever held an intellectual converse with men of the mind he saw one such before him callista felt it would be plunging her soul still deeper into shadows when she sought realities if she must take part in such an argument she remained silent uh, your sister has not the fit upon her asked polemo of aristo aside neither liking her reception of him nor knowing what to say not at all dear thing answered aristo she is all attention for you to begin natives of greece at length said he natives of greece should know each other they deserve to know each other there is a secret sympathy between them like that mysterious influence which unites magnet to magnet or like the echo which is a repercussion of the original voice so in like manner greeks are what none but they can be and he smelt at his rose and bowed she smiled faintly when he mentioned greece yes she said i am fonder of greece than of africa each has its advantages said polemo there is a pleasure in imparting knowledge in lighting flame from flame it would be selfish did we not leave greece to communicate what they have not here but you he added lady neither can learn in greece nor teach in africa while you are in this vestibule of orcus i understand however it is your own choice can that be possible well i wish to get out if i could most learned polemo said callista sadly may polemo of rhodes speak frankly to callista of proconesis asked polemo i would not speak to every one if so let me ask what keeps you here the magistrates of sicca and this iron chain answered callista i would i could be elsewhere i would i were not what i am what could you wish to be more than you are answered polemo more gifted accomplished beautiful than any daughter of africa uh, go to the point polemo said aristo nervously though respectfully she wants home thrusts i see my brother wants you to ask how far it depends on me that i am here said callista wishing to hasten his movements it is because i will not burn incense upon the altar of jupiter a most insufficient reason lady said polemo callista was silent 
what does that action mean said polemo it proposes to mean nothing else than that you are loyal to the roman power you are not of those greeks i presume who dream of a national insurrection at this time then you are loyal to rome did i believe a leonidas could now arise an harmodius a miltiades a themistocles a pericles an epimonidas i should be as ready to take the sword as another but it is hopeless greece then makes no claim on you just now nor will i believe though you were to tell me so yourself that you are leagued with any obscure fanatic sect who desire rome's downfall consider what rome is and now he had got into the magnificent commonplace out of his last panegyrical oration with which he had primed himself before he set out i am a greek he said i love greece but i love truth better and i look at facts i grasp them and i confess to them the wide earth through untold centuries has at length grown into the imperial dominion of one it has converged and coalesced in all its various parts into one rome this which we see is the last the perfect state of human society the course of things the force of natural powers as is well understood by all great lawyers and philosophers cannot go further unity has come at length and unity is eternity it will be for ever because it is a whole the principle of dissolution is eliminated we have reached the apotelesma of the world greece egypt assyria libya etruria lydia have all had their share in the result each of them in its own day has striven in vain to stop the course of fate and has been hurried onward at its wheel as its victim or its instrument and shall judea do what profound egypt and subtle greece have tried in vain if even the freedom of thought the liberal scepticism nay the revolutionary theories of hellas have proved unequal to the task of splitting up the roman power if the pomp and luxury of the east have failed shall the mysticism of syria succeed well dear callista are you listening cried aristo not overconfident of the fact though polemo looked round at him with astonishment ten centuries he continued ten centuries have just been completed since rome began her victorious career for ten centuries she has been fulfilling her high mission in the dispositions of destiny and perfecting her maxims of policy and rules of government for ten centuries she has pursued one track with an ever-growing intensity of zeal and an ever-widening extent of territory what can she not do just one thing and that one thing which she has not presumed to do you are attempting she has maintained her own religion as was fitting but she has never thrown contempt on the religion of others this you are doing observe callista rome herself in spite of her great power has yielded to that necessity which is greater she does not meddle with the religions of the peoples she has opened no war against their diversities of right the conquering power found especially in the east innumerable traditions customs prejudices principles superstitions matted together in one hopeless mass she left them as they were she recognized them it would have been the worse for her if she had done otherwise all she said to the peoples all she dared say to them was you bear with me and i will bear with you yet this you will not do you christians who have no pretence to any territory who are not even the smallest of the peoples who are not even a people at all you have the fanaticism to denounce all other rights but your own nay the religion of great rome 
who are you upstarts and vagabonds of yesterday older religions than yours more intellectual more beautiful religions which have had a position and a history and a political influence have come to naught and shall you prevail you a congeries a hotchpotch of the leavings and scraps and broken meat of the great peoples of the east and west blush blush grecian callista you with a glorious nationality of your own to go shares with some hundred peasants slaves thieves beggars hucksters tinkers cobblers and fishermen a lady of high character of brilliant accomplishments to be the associate of the outcasts of society polemo's speech though cumbrous did execution at least the termination of it upon minds constituted like the grecian aristo jumped up swore an oath and looked round triumphantly at callista who felt its force also after all what did she know of christians at best she was leaving the known for the unknown she was sure to be embracing certain evil for contingent good she said to herself no i never can be a christian then she said aloud my lord polemo i am not a christian i never said i was that is her absurdity cried aristo she is neither one thing nor the other she won't say she's a christian and she won't sacrifice it is my misfortune she said i know i am losing both what i see and what i don't see it is most inconsistent yet what can i do polemo had said what he considered enough he was one of those who sold his words he had already been over generous and was disposed to give away no more after a time callisto said polemo do you believe in one god certainly he answered i believe in one eternal self-existing something well she said i feel that god within my heart i feel myself in his presence he says to me do this don't do that you may tell me that this dictate is a mere law of my nature as is to joy or to grieve i cannot understand this no it is the echo of a person speaking to me nothing shall persuade me that it does not ultimately proceed from a person external to me it carries with it its proof of its divine origin my nature feels towards it as towards a person when i obey it i feel a satisfaction when i disobey a soreness just like that which i feel in pleasing or offending some revered friend so you see polemo i believe in what is more than a mere something i believe in what is more real to me than sun moon stars and the fair earth and the voice of friends you will say who is he has he ever told you anything about himself alas no the more's the pity but i will not give up what i have because i have not more an echo implies a voice a voice a speaker that speaker i love and i fear here she was exhausted and overcome to poor callista with her own emotions oh that i could find him she exclaimed passionately on the right hand and on the left i grope but touch him not why dost thou fight against me why dost thou scare and perplex me o oh, first and only fair i have thee not and i need thee she added i am no christian you see or i should have found him 
for at least I should say I had found him. It is hopeless, said Polemo to Aristo in much disgust and with some hauteur of manner. She is too far gone. You should not have brought me to this place. Aristo groaned. Oh. Shall I, she continued, worship any but him? Shall I say that he whom I see not, whom I seek, is our Jupiter, or Caesar, or the goddess of Rome? They are none of them images of this inward guide of mine. I sacrifice to him alone. The two men looked at each other in amazement, one of them in anger. It's like the demon of Socrates said aristo timidly i will acknowledge caesar in every fitting way she repeated but i will not make him my god presently she added polemo will not that invisible monitor have something to say to all of us to you at some future day spare me spare me callista cried polemo starting up with a violence unsuited to his station and profession spare my ears unhappy woman such words have never hitherto entered them i did not come to be insulted poor blind hapless perverse spirit i separate myself from you for ever desert if you will the majestic bright beneficent traditions of your forefathers and live in this frightful superstition farewell he did not seem better pleased with aristo than with callista though aristo helped him into his litter walked by his side and did what he could to propitiate him End of chapter twenty eight